professor of psychiatry at uh, Department of Psychiatry, University of uh, Witwatersrand, Johannesburg, South Africa. He was the editor in chief of uh, Global Psychiatry Archives from 2018 to 2023. Uh, previously, he was also the editor of uh, African Journal of Psychiatry. His uh, areas of interest include uh, eating disorders, ethics, leadership, and adolescent psychiatry. Over to you, Professor Christopher, for uh, your presentation on uh, psychiatrist as a podcaster. Personal reflection. Digit, thanks for your introduction. Thanks to Rainer for inviting me. Um, I'm not sure he'll thank me after this, but uh, this is going to be a little bit of a story, it's a personal story, and it's and it's and it's about an experience that I've had in recent times. And when Rainer invited me to uh, do a presentation, I, I I thought this would be something that would be a little bit different um, in terms of what others would be presenting and also provide some kind of insight into this, well, one could call it a new technology, and it's interface really between education and technology. And I think the podcast represents a very interesting uh, development in that. And so I'm gonna take you on a journey, my own personal journey, so please, but don't think of me as egotistical, this is not about me, it's about the journey. And uh, for any of you who would be interested in becoming a podcaster or hosting a podcast, hopefully I will give you some insights into what that entails. So the first thing is obviously, what is a podcast? And I think that many people who listen to podcasts or are consumers of podcasts have a clear understanding of what it is, but there are many people who don't. And essentially, it's a bit like the radio, but it's not. So obviously, you don't switch on the radio to listen to a podcast you log on and it comes to you via the internet. And so basically it's a download, it's a, it's a stream. It's streamed to your device, be it your laptop computer or your cell phone, either way. And the issue here is that it's available always and you can listen to it anywhere at any time. I think it's very accessible and very convenient if you have the technology, obviously. So in essence, it's, audio, but it can be video, and usually a podcast is on a specific theme, and you will get to hear what my particular podcast was about. Those who podcast are called podcasters. One thing they say, though, is that it's simple to create. I'm not so sure that it's simple to create, and I think you will see exactly why as I walk you through all the different steps, and I show you the role players, and I name names for the sake of completion in terms of who they are and who they were, also to acknowledge them. So just to put it in perspective, as of September 2023, there were supposedly over 3 million such podcasts available, and some think it actually over 4 million. So when you produce a podcast and you put it out there, you've got a lot of competition in terms of the audience that you're potentially vying for. To give you some perspective in terms of podcasts, the top five, maybe you have or haven't heard of Joe Rogan. If you haven't, okay. If you have, welcome. He has... 11 million listeners per episode. That's a lot of people. If you look at the next four combined, they don't actually add up the number of listeners he has in episode per episode they have combined. And you can see, in fact, the numbers two and number five with crime. So there's a kind of a preoccupation with crime for podcast listeners. But Joe Rogan is the quintessential podcaster. He's the, uh, he's the benchmark. And uh, he is an interesting guy because his podcasts last over three hours. And uh, they are really conversations that are very deep, but also move in all sorts of different directions. So if you haven't watched a Joe Rogan podcast, it's, it, it's well worth And you'll be surprised who he interviews, in fact. So just to put it in perspective in terms of what a successful podcast might be, if you get three and a half thousand downloads, you're in the top 10%. Remembering we're talking about a three to four million base of, of podcasts. If you get 9,000 downloads, that's 9,000 people who download the podcast from the internet to listen to it. That will put you in the top 5%. And if you get 50,000, you're in the top 1%. Rogan gets 11 million. That just gives you some perspective on, on, on how people download and, and what success might mean in that sense, although success is a relative term. The reality, though, is that only 60% of people actually listen all the way through. There's a big attrition rate 
in terms of podcast listening. But I think what is important is that if you engage listeners who are really interested, they can have an impact. And I think what is important about podcasts is to put out quality content, but to release new episodes on a regular basis because your audience moves on very quickly. You have to know that you're in a very competitive market. And I think that one has to be very careful not to be numbers driven. Because if you're numbers driven, you lose the potential impact of the people who listen, who then actually uh, influence others around them in terms of the in terms of the content. So I'm just going to walk you through quickly the idea, the finished product. So obviously for me it was a novel experience. I have no training. Um, I've done a lot of media work in terms of television, radio, and being interviewed, but never actually having to host an actual program and structure it and construct it and carry it as such. So it's, 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 it's one thing to be interviewed. It's another thing to actually create the content and bring people in who you actually interview. And of course, when I thought about it, I thought, well, as psychiatrists, what do we do? We interview people. When I see a new patient, what am I doing? It's an interview, actually. And I spend an hour and a half or two hours chatting to them, getting information. It's an interview. So I thought, okay, I can maybe translate the experience I have as a psychiatrist into this new milieu. Well, it's a completely different milieu, I must tell you, but the skill of, of interviewing is something that we inherently have as psychiatrists, even though we might not spend that many minutes, as Prof. Sartorius has highlighted with our patients, it just depends what kind of practice you have. So, looking at the idea, so this concept of a pitch, for the idea to turn into a product, you have to pitch the idea. You've got to actually formulate what it is you want to do, and you have to take it to the right people, specifically a funder, because podcasts cost money. They don't happen for free. If you're going to produce a quality product, you need to make sure that you have sufficient funds to do it. So you're going to see a timeline here, which shows you just how quickly things worked. So from the 7th of August, 2021, I had my first meeting with a potential funder happened to be from a pharmaceutical company and one could raise eyebrows and say pharmaceutical industry one has to be very careful in terms of your relationship with them i have to say up front they had absolutely zero input into the content and never attempted to influence who i interviewed what we were talking about and i was simply funded in order to produce these because they felt that it was something that they wanted to be involved in and i think coming back to the issue of education so they saw this as a, something that added value to their portfolio of input into the medical discipline. The funder then connected me with someone who was experienced in producing podcasts and was connected to folk who do that. So I met with them, we workshopped the ideas, and then we started to put together content to pitch the idea, firstly, to the folk who were going to produce the podcast, but then ultimately also to the funder. So that's 7th of August to the 16th to the 24th. So within two, three weeks. So this is basically just an idea of, 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 of what we sent to them. And I think what's important is that the podcast had a name, Beyond Madness. I decided on that title and I'd explain why I called it Beyond Madness. I had this idea in my head about the music for the podcast, because if you listen to podcasts, there's always music that introduces the uh, actual episode. And in my head, I had this idea of Jimi Hendrix. I like the guitar introduction. But of course, that was completely unrealistic because in order to use such music, there are licensing fees. So basically, there's a library of product that you can use, music, which doesn't cost, but you can maybe get the feel of, of what you want. We noted who it would be funded by. And initially, we were going to do 13, 30-minute episodes. And basically, we put down all the specifics when we were due to start. And I think what's important is that we were very uh, specific about the platform. Very important who you choose to host your podcast. And we chose a very specific platform. And their responsibility was not just to produce the podcast, but they also had other functions, and specifically the issue of banners. And I'm going to get to that. So for the first season, um, we had a range of topics. And we looked at genetics, the biological basis of madness, 
we use the, the word madness quite a lot in the first season. Um, but in fact, the first episode turned out to be the practice of psychiatry in a cross-cultural South Africa. And I can tell you, the first episode was due to be a discussion with myself and a fellow psychiatrist who had written a book called Madness, Stories of Uncertainty and Hope. It was an absolute disaster. The audio failed. He was not in studio. He was phoning in. And I thought to myself, if this is what podcasting is all about, I don't think I can do this. Fortunately for me, the next episode was going to be recorded immediately after. I had the guest outside waiting, and I didn't have too much opportunity to reflect on how difficult the first attempt had been. And so that was the episode that I recorded first, which was practice of psychiatry in a cross-cultural South Africa. And I think what's important here, speaking to a South African audience and beyond, is that we were looking at traditional healers and the role of traditional healers in psychiatry and the extent to which traditional healers actually serve a very important function in terms of gatekeeping because patients often go there first. And so this was trying to give a perspective on where traditional healers fit in. And you can see there was a whole range of conditions eating disorders, but also issues, spirituality in the healing process. And the podcast I eventually recorded with David Nutt had nothing to do with cannabis. In fact, it was to do with psychedelics. So the process unfolded. The platform were very happy to meet with us. We then met with them ultimately. But before we did that, we brought in another member of the team, public relations. The public relations person out a media release so they need to know exactly what your podcast is what it's about who you are what you're attempting to achieve that then goes out to the media they then have an interest hopefully in speaking to you and then you start to promote the podcast in the media as much as anywhere else and that can be television radio or print so having met with the pr we revised our pitch and then we had the big meeting and the team started to emerge. So now we're on 3rd of September. So literally within a month, we are sitting at the platform, which is Cliff Central, cliffcentral.com. We actually recorded the first episode on the 4th of October. So you can see the timeline and it was released on the 20th of October. So the first episode of the first season went out literally six, uh, let's just say two and a half months, nearly three months after we had the inception. The first season comprised 15 episodes. That's what a banner looks like. So that's what appears on the Cliff Central platform for the podcast. So if you go onto their platform, you'll see they've got a whole host of podcasts. That's what a banner looks like, the name of the podcast, who funds it, who I am, and what the episode is. And each episode has this banner. So that's me in the studio, uh, together with my first guest, Solly Ratamani. So Cliff Central, see the microphone, the headphones. It's like being in a radio studio, but it's not radio. And as much as we are recording live, it's not broadcast live, it's recorded and then released. If there's any editing to do, you have an opportunity to, to do that after the recording. So who is the team? And I think this is what's important. Going back to the original slide that said, it's quite simple to produce a podcast. First of all, you've got the studio or the platform. That was Click Central. Then you've got the sponsor or the funder. This was Adcock Ingram OTC, a local pharmaceutical company. Then you've got the producer, who changed from one to the other during the course of the seasons that we recorded. You've got a sound engineer. He's the guy who gives you the music, but more than that, listens to make sure that the technical aspects of the podcast are exactly as they need to be. You've got the public relations, and you've got a banner designer. And in this instance, the banner designer actually became the sound engineer as the seasons unfolded, because he was in training. You can see there are a few people involved, aside from myself, who comprise the team. So not quite so simple. This is the last banner the, for, the, for season four. You can see how it evolved and also the music evolved. Things changed. My mood changed. I felt like a change. And so the podcast also changed in terms of um, the duration. From half an hour, we went to one hour. From having one guest, we went to having two or sometimes three guests. And I think what's important is that it's not just a QA, and a it's a conversation. And I think this will be highlighted as we get to understanding. Now, this has got nothing to do with the, the, the studio. This was actually arising out of public relations. One of the radio stations picked up on the podcast. They interviewed me. And the program that interviewed me was one thing, but there was another program on the same radio station who decided they wanted to host me for a month, every single Wednesday to talk about mental health issues. So it gathered a life of its own. And that was, that was an interesting experience. So we did 60 episodes. <laughs> 
date. It's been four seasons. And uh, you can find us on clickcentral.com, Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts. And we've had pretty good ratings. We, I mean, we're looking at 4.9 on Spotify, 4.7 on Apple. That's about as much feedback as, as, as one gets. One doesn't really get a lot of feedback. You meet people from time to time who've listened, and they will share with you. Unfortunately, it's generally been very positive. So the podcast ran from the 21st of October. The last episode, episode 60, was released on the 25th of July. We're in a bit of a pause now, which I will mention shortly. And what was really interesting for me is that we were picked up by a platform, which is the number one Spanish podcasts, and they literally lifted the entire 60 episodes and put it on their platform. No permission requested, nothing we could do about it. And I kind of looked at, in this instance, theft as a kind of a backhanded compliment because they obviously thought it was of sufficient interest. Season two, you can see the kind of topics. And what's really pertinent right now, one of our episodes was about photographers and the psychological impact of being a photographer in a war zone. If we think about what's going on in the Middle East and what's going in, on in Ukraine, we were talking specifically to what it's like to be a journalist in a war zone and how that impacts upon you. We touched on divorce. We looked at the impact of social media on youth. So we touched on a lot of issues rather than talking about specific conditions. And in this particular season, I was kind of interested in dealing with what's it like to have a sufferer at home? If you're a spouse, if you're a sibling, if you're a family, how do you cope with that? So the theme of living with somebody with an eating disorder or living with someone with a learning disability or with a substance abuse problem. So we then moved on to our final season via season three. And the season has, has, has been Again, very issues driven, looking at the impact of bullying, for example, looking at childhood sexual abuse, loneliness, a very pervasive universal phenomenon, poverty and mental illness, which is a big issue here in South Africa. We have very high levels of poverty and not just looking at the interaction between poverty and mental illness in terms of my guests. I had an additional guest who actually owned a restaurant and had started a soup kitchen for homeless people and their experience of homeless individuals and being homeless themselves because they took to the streets for a period of time just to get the feel of what it was to be homeless gave a very important quality to the podcast. And we have a huge problem in South Africa with gender-based violence. I did one of my podcasts, which was focused on, in this particular instance, a horrendous gang rape that had taken place uh, involving multiple young women and uh, the impact of sexual violence on the psyche of the uh, uh, victim. And so we were looking at PTSD in that specific instance. So we really covered a broad range of issues, but the one that we ended off with was a very different kind of podcast because I had three journalists. We were talking about journalism and mental health. And once again, looking at what's been happening to journalists in the Middle East and, and the Ukraine and how many have actually been killed uh, in their line of duty in these situations. So in this particular podcast, we actually had a studio audience. So it was the first time that we had done that and we had a Q&A session. So we actually got to engage with the audience. So this was recorded both in terms of the visuals, which is a, a, a separate component, and then we condensed the sound into a standard audio podcast as well. So that was something of an evolution in terms of the, the podcast. So just looking in terms of the content, just a few personal reflections. Every episode has an introduction where I set the scene. So you really need to be au okay fait with content. And that introduction, well, be after that. The, the introduction that I'm talking about introduces the podcast, introduces myself, what the podcast is about. And that's consistent across every single episode. And so that's the intro. And then there's what we call an outro, which is exactly the same, just a, an abbreviated version. And the music is very important, I think. It kind of creates the mood. I moved from something which was a little bit more edgy to start with to something a bit more jazzy in the fourth season, which was more the way I was feeling by the time I'd gotten there. And we used as part of the outro the World Health Organization uh, mantra, no health without mental health. And this was a consistent throughout all of the episodes. So I think... Your preparation is critical when you're putting together a podcast. And so after the intro, I would then editorialize a little bit where basically I set the scene. I frame the conversation up front. I think you need to structure the conversation. There needs to be a logical flow, but there's got to be flexibility within that because at the end of the day, it is a conversation 
And then there is the take home message, which is your outro. And I think it's very important how you choose your guests. You need to have a sense of who you're gonna have. Otherwise you might find yourself with a nasty surprise. I think it's very important that they are not simply mental health professionals, but anybody who's a thought leader in the area that you're gonna be discussing. So those are my scripts. So every single episode was scripted and I have those scripts. And uh, those took me a while, each one. When I was thinking about what it takes to actually produce an hour of, of, of podcast, about six to seven hours, maybe longer, of preparation per episode. So it certainly takes a level of commitment. What about the platform, lessons learned? They must have the technical ability and they should hopefully have what I call a stable of content where they are known for their podcast production. So you want to see what other podcasts they actually produce to get a sense of them. They should have an existing audience because they promote from within the platform. And of course, the support they give you and the promotion they give you is very important. And before every new season, I would go on with the uh, uh, um, founder of Cliff Central, Gareth Cliff. He's the guy on my right-hand side. And we would do a one-hour uh, interview where we would talk about psychiatry and mental health. And he would promote the podcast and alert his listeners to the fact that there's a new season about to start on that day. So the promotion is actually very important. So why did I do this, actually? Because I had no intention of ever doing a podcast. But I had been editor of South African Psychiatry, which is a medical publication. And what I essentially did was I converted the written word to the spoken word. Many of my guests had actually submitted and written articles for South African Psychiatry because I think there's something different when you have a conversation. Something more comes out. Written words are static. The conversation is much more fluid. And it can take you in a array of different directions that you hadn't anticipated. I think what was also important about the podcast, and that's the educational component, the access. And I think that's what's important and very interesting about the podcast is that it's accessible information and it's always there and anybody can access it. Patients have families, patients have friends, patients have colleagues, they come from communities. It's important that everybody has that access. And all of these people who don't necessarily get to see or experience a psychiatrist are getting that kind of information, which could be helpful for them. So one of the, uh, so, so, so the byline of South African psychiatry is about the discipline for the discipline. The podcast, when I thought about it, was about the discipline, but for the public. So we were taking it beyond the discipline. So why did I use the, the name Beyond Madness? Well, I wanted to take people behind the scenes, beyond the immediate clinical reality of what psychiatrists did, and look at some of the conversations that psychiatrists have and essentially, what do psychiatrists talk about when they talk about psychiatry? I could remember so many discussions that I would have when I was training and after I was training with colleagues in the duty room, the, the nurse's station, where we would talk about patients, talk about psychiatry. And I always found those so helpful. And in a sense, I wanted to take those conversations and put them out there because I think they were also very informative, not just for me, but for anybody who might have been listening. And the one thing I also attempted to do was to show how psychiatry has implications for society, but how societal uh, happenings, things that go on in society, have profound implications for emotional well-being and mental health. So we were really looking at this interaction between psychiatry and society. In terms of what I was trying to do, ultimately, I think it's a bit of a busy slide, but the truth is I wanted to show people the richness of psychiatry. Psychiatry is not this hard, simple biological science where patients are reduced to genes or molecules. They're living human beings. And I think that psychiatry has a lot of art beyond the science. And there's a lot of thought that goes into psychiatry. It's probably, for me, the most thoughtful of all the disciplines. I also wanted to humanize psychiatrists. People have a lot of stereotypes, not just about psychiatric patients, but about psychiatrists. And I needed to humanize psychiatrists to show who they are, how they think. I think what was also important was to show that mentally ill people should not simply be defined by their mental illness, their people. And I suppose in essence, what I was doing was ultimately destigmatizing both patients and practitioners. So you could say, well, so what? The podcast, what about it? Well, podcasts are an increasingly popular medium. As you see, there are many millions out there and many, many millions of listeners. It's accessible, it's empowering. A lot of people now get their information from podcasts actually, not just content in terms of theoretical information, but even their news is coming through 
podcasts. And I think it's very empowering in that sense. Also, an available resource at no cost to the listener. Of course, you have to have the technology. The practitioners, trainees, patients and families. But what I found interesting is that one of the leading organizations in South Africa, the South African Depression and Anxiety Group, who do a great service to patients and their families, actually was using the podcast to train their counselors. So this was really very gratifying for me because I thought, great, it's being used because that's what it's there for. It's a resource, it doesn't cost you, take it, use it, benefit from it. So what did we achieve? I don't know, to be honest with you, practically. Very difficult to say. Did we promote awareness and create understanding? Well, Gareth Cliff, who's from cliffcentral.com, said to me, consider this. He said, because we used to get over 2,000, getting up to 3,000 downloads per episode. He said, think about you lecturing over 2,000 people in a hall every week for 60 consecutive weeks. And I began to realize, yes, that's a lot of people that you reach actually, when you think about when you go to a conference and you lecture to people, when you lecture to an audience, that's a lot of people and you're doing it over a consecutive period. So hopefully it had some reach and hopefully it had an impact. Did the sponsor benefit? I don't know. Did it lead to more sales of their product? Well, we never promoted any of their products actually. So that wasn't the agenda. What was interesting is that we did get nominated for uh, we, did, we got the finalists in an award, uh, best use of podcast to promote a brand or an event. We were up against serious opposition, so there was no chance of us ever winning. But to be a finalist was sufficient, and these were the new generation social and digital media awards. So that is where the podcasting fits in, social and digital media. So this is the new media. What was achieved personally? Well, I found it enriching. I found it demanding though, it really was, and very consuming. Because I think when you putting content out there that could potentially influence people's lives and you're not sure who you're talking to, you've got to be very careful what you say, how you say it, the views you promote. And so there is a burden of responsibility on the podcaster in that sense. Currently we're on a pause, which we agreed to by both myself and, and the team. We'll see where it goes. So will there be a season five? I don't know. But what I'm going to leave you with is a 90-second clip that Cliff Central put together for the sponsor just to give them an overview of what has been accomplished by the podcast over these 60 episodes. You'll see for yourself. I think it gives you a nice snapshot of uh, what took place. And so sit back and here's the clip. right there you have it that's the um 
that's the presentation. So if there are any questions or comments, I'm certainly available. Uh, and, uh, and hang on. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Christopher, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, this is not a conventional presentation that is usually seen in conferences. This is something no. very new and out of uh, <laughs> the main core of uh, biological psychiatry or psychosocial 